Excerpts from Joseph Goebbels' diary, 1924. I was born on October 29, 1897, in Reit, a small industrial town near Dusseldorf on the Lower Rhine. My father, Fritz, was a clerk, earning 150 marks a month. Around 1900, he bought a small, unprepossessing house slightly further up Dahlinerstrasse, where we still live today. Blick auf den kleinen Hof hinter dem Wohnhaus. Im Hintergrund der Lieblingsplatz des jungen Josef Goebbels. Die Volksschule in der Josef Goebbels Straße, in der der junge Josef Goebbels seine ersten Schuljahre verbrachte. I can recall a protracted illness, pneumonia. I had a fever and dreadful hallucinations, which left me weak and frail as a child. Then I remember a Sunday when our family took a long walk to Geistenbeck. Next day, the problem with my foot returned. What incredible pain. Despite months of treatment, my foot was paralyzed for life. From that moment, my youth held little joy for me. I had to look after myself and could no longer join in the other children's games. I became lonely and solitary. My former friends had no affection for me. Auf der Straße nach Rheindalen, einem beliebten Ausflugsort der Reitereinwohner, besonders zur Kirmeszeit. Nineteen fifteen to nineteen eighteen. My love for Lena Krage, a first kiss in Gartenstrasse. Lena is headstrong, so there's plenty of anguish. I start keeping a diary. I write many poems. They are all lost. I spend all my time with Lena in a state of youthful bliss. Then 1917, and a painfully hungry year. We get through it somehow. Goodbye to Lena. Locked inside the Kaiser Park at night, I kiss her breast for the first time. For the first time, she gives herself to me. Banking and the stock exchange, industry and market capital. Need focuses one's thoughts. I write despairing poems, Jews. I reflect on my financial predicament, spiritual illumination, Bavaria, Hitler, books, Thomas Mann and Heinrich Mann's Man of Straw, Dostoevsky's The Idiot. I am overwhelmed. The revolution is inside me, but I remain pessimistic about everything. I loathe Cologne. The bank is a waste of time. My salary next to nothing. And I can't bear it anymore. So I decide to go sick. July 4th, 1924. We need a firm hand in Germany. Let's put an end to all the experiments and empty words and start getting down to serious work. Throw out the Jews who refuse to become real Germans. Give them a good beating, too. Germany is yearning for an individual, a man, as the earth yearns for rain in the summer. Only our reserves of strength, enthusiasm, and utter commitment can save us now. Can only a miracle, and nothing less, save us? July 17th, 1924. I'm so despondent about everything. Everything I try goes totally wrong. There's no escape from this hole here. I feel drained. So far, I still haven't found a real purpose in life. Sometimes I'm afraid to get out of bed in the morning. There's nothing to get up for. Konditorei Remges, die Dr. Goebbels in seiner Primaner Zeit gern besuchte. Seine Stammplätze. 
in der Josef Goebbels Straße. My life lacks any meaning. I'm meandering aimlessly, lost in the universe. Lack of money is oppressive. What a terrible fate. Why bother to read these wretched newspapers? It just makes you feel more stupid. Politics is killing me. September 27th, 1924. My reputation as an orator and political and cultural author is spreading throughout the Rhineland among supporters of National Socialism. This evening, I am giving a speech in Neuss. I never prepare. Talking impromptu isn't nearly as difficult as I imagined. But practice, I tell myself, makes perfect. I'll get some practice at this small gathering of supporters. I can feel satisfied with my assignment. I get satisfaction from this type of work. My quest is for the new Reich and the new man, and I can find them only through faith. Faith in ourselves will guide us to final victory. Heil! April the 13th, 1926. I arrived in Munich in the evening. Hitler's car was there. We drove to the hotel. What a grand reception. I spoke in the historic Burgerbräu. Kaufingerstrasse, Frauenkirche, awesome Gothic architecture. Went to the Bratwurstglöckler, sausages and beer. Living in Munich, engagingly bourgeois. A delightful city, and the sun was shining on us. Back to the hotel where I learned that Hitler had phoned. He wanted to welcome us, and in 15 minutes he was there, tall, healthy, and vigorous. I like him. He puts us to shame with his kindness. We met, we asked questions, he gave brilliant replies. I love him. The social issue, completely new insights. He has it all thought out. His ideal, a mixture of collectivism and individualism. Production must remain a matter for individuals. Big corporations, trusts, etc., are all to be nationalized. This is what we discuss. I can accept this firebrand as my leader. I bow to his superiority. I acknowledge his political genius. June 16th, 1926. Hitler is still the same dear comrade. You can't help liking him as a person. And he has a stupendous mind. As a speaker, he has constructed a wonderful harmony of gesture, facial expression, and spoken word, the born motivator. With him, we can conquer the world. Give him his head, and he will shake the corrupt republic to its foundations. October 30th, 1926, Plauen. A letter from Hitler. My job in Berlin has been approved. Hooray! I'll be there in a week's time. April 26th, 1928. Gave a talk in Friedenau yesterday. A tight-ass bourgeois audience. Slowly but surely, I got through to them, though. Later that evening, they attack us in the streets. I saw Eisenstein's film, Ten Days That Shook the World. It's too contrived, and the best scenes are ruined. Some crowd shots are very good. Hm. So that's what revolution is. We can learn a lot from these Bolsheviks, most of all from their use of propaganda. 
but the film is too explicitly propagandistic. Less would have been more effective. May 17, 1928. I drove cross-country with a detachment of the SA. Ascension day and glorious weather. We set out from Pickelsdorfer Bridge, then via Spandau, Neuendorf, Tegel. Everything fine until then. Then we took Müllerstrasse into Wedding. A glorious parade. The streets were lined with communists shouting and whistling. Our people were marching forwards. They were the real heroes, never wavering, never giving an inch. With such people, we will one day conquer the world. May 24th, 1928. Our new office is taking shape. We are all hard at work. I sat at home and worked. Only now do I realize how tired I am. I long for the gentle touch of a woman's hand. October 16th, 1928. What does Christianity mean today? National socialism is a religion. All we lack is a religious genius capable of uprooting outmoded religious practices and putting new ones in their place. We lack traditions and ritual. One day soon, national socialism will be the religion of all Germans. My party is my church, and I believe I serve the Lord best if I do his will and liberate my oppressed people from the fetters of slavery. That is my gospel. October the 26th, 1928. I have no friends and no wife. I seem to be going through a major spiritual crisis. I still have the same old problems with my foot, which gives me incessant pain and discomfort. And then there are the rumors to the effect that I am homosexual. Agitators are trying to break up our movement, and I'm constantly tied up in minor squabbles. It's enough to make you weep. April the 5th, 1929. We still have too many Philistines in the party. Sometimes the policy devised in Munich is intolerable. I have no intention of acquiescing in meaningless compromises. I'm sticking to my beliefs, even if it costs me my position. I sometimes have my doubts about Hitler. Why doesn't he speak up? The opportunists want to reap the harvest before it's ripe. There has already been serious confusion in the SA. When I see everything we have sacrificed so much to bring about, going to the dogs, I want to scream out loud. 14 Jahren scharte sich eine Handvoll entschlossener Nationalsozialisten um ihren neuen Gauleiter von Berlin. Unter seiner Führung begann der Kampf um die Rote Reichshauptstadt. Zäh und verbissen, auf fast verlorenen Posten, setzte sich die alte Garde gegen den Terror der Systemregierung und des bolschewistischen Untermenschentums durch. August the 1st, 1929. The party convention has started. The SA are already marching below, singing. Latest news, I am supposed to resign my Berlin post and move to Munich as new head of propaganda. They want to strip me of real power and replace it with the appearance of authority. So, that's their game. I'm going to ask the boss about it at lunchtime. I don't believe he's thinking along those lines. If he is, I'm going to quit. I'm not going to waste time slaving for the party. But there's no point in going on about problems. Outside, the SA troopers are marching by singing. The weather is just beautiful. March 16th, 1930. I've lost faith in everything in Munich, including the boss. I don't believe a word they say anymore. For whatever reason, that doesn't matter. Hitler has broken his word to me five times. That's painful, and I have drawn my own private conclusions. Hitler is hiding away. He never takes any decisions. He isn't leading us anymore, but just letting things drift. I was as loyal as one can be, 
but nobody can expect me to sit by and watch Strasser take over in Berlin. September the 12th, 1930. Success in the elections is assured. We have about 250,000 votes in Berlin. I arrived home exhausted after one hour's sleep. I made seven speeches in the evening. A record, I think. But I'm a nervous wreck now. I'm full of anxiety. I'm behaving as if there was something we still needed to do. Our election propaganda has been exemplary. September 15th, 1930. I am shaking with excitement. The first election results. Fantastic. Jubilation everywhere. An incredible success. It's stunning. The bourgeois parties have been smashed. So far, we have 103 seats. That's a tenfold increase. I would never have expected it. The mood of enthusiasm reminds me of 1914, when war broke out. Things will get pretty hot in the months ahead. The communists did well, but we are the second largest party. Now we just stay the course. Never tire, never flag. Ich halte diesen Reichstag für vollkommen überfällig und bin der Überzeugung, dass er aufgelöst werden muss, weil er nicht mehr dem Willen des Volkes entspricht. February 15th, 1931. Magda Quant came round this evening and stayed for a very long time. She is becoming a ravishingly sweet blonde. My lovely queen, a beautiful, truly beautiful woman. And I feel I will love her deeply. I am walking around in a dream today. How wonderful it is to love a beautiful woman and to have that love returned. February 21st, 1931. Göring is a morphine addict. The boss wants to confront him. He does the craziest things. Sometimes he thinks he is chancellor, at other times minister of defense. We have a classic case of megalomania. He needs urgent treatment. At the moment, he looks utterly ridiculous. April the 28th, 1931. The party needs to become more Prussian. It needs to be more socialist. Hitler understands me, but he has his own reservations. I've managed to convince him to come to Berlin more often and devote more time to the question of socialism. He trusts me and has condemned the smears in the party against me. Berlin is yours and that's how things are going to stay, he says. I need this to happen. June 17th, 1931. Magda gives me strength and imagination. I am overjoyed to possess her. She is now my own. Now I know I have someone who belongs to me completely and will always stand by me. And I belong to her as well. The party comes first, then Magda. Love doesn't hinder me, it drives me on. June 30th, 1931. I've uncovered an extensive plot. The SS is running a spy ring here in Berlin and keeping me under surveillance. They are spreading the most astonishing rumors. I think they are agent provocateurs. On Thursday in Munich, I will be demanding that this shithole is closed immediately. Either I have Hitler's confidence or I don't. I'm not going to keep working under these conditions. Himmler hates me. Now I am going to bring him down. We need to get rid of this unscrupulous bastard. Goering agrees with me. December 20th, 1931. 
At last, the waiting is over. We both gave our word, then we entered our signatures. First me, then Magda, then Epp, then Hitler. And now Magda is my wife. I am overjoyed. Now we are all truly happy. The SA formed a guard of honor. People were shouting out their good wishes. Maria was the bridesmaid, Harold my aide-de-camp wearing SA uniform. Pastor Wenzel presided over the service. He wasn't bad, but these clerics are all the same. And then he slipped the rings onto our fingers. At last, Magda was mine. Outside, SA members were calling out their best wishes. Hitler had tears of joy in his eyes. He said, I wish you a lifetime of happiness and hope you remain my good friend. I gave him my pledge. Magda will help me keep it. January 31st, 1933. We've made it. We've set up shop in Wilhelmstrasse. Hitler is chancellor. It's like a fairy tale come true. The end result, Frick, Minister of the Reich, Goering, Minister of the Interior for Prussia. We all had tears in our eyes. We shook Hitler's hand. He deserved it. Wonderful euphoria. People were going mad below. In the coalitions, the conservatives got deputy chancellor and minister of labor. We'll shortly get rid of them. The torchbearers were on their way. The parade started at 7 p.m. and it lasted until past midnight. A million people on the streets. Hindenburg saluted the marchers. Hitler was in the next building. A new beginning. An explosion of popular energy. Bigger and bigger crowds. I spoke on the radio to every German station. We are immensely happy, I said. Am 30. Januar ist die nationale Revolution ausgebrochen. Diese Revolution macht nirgends Halt. Sie hat das politische Leben umgestellt und eine Reform der deutschen Nation an Haupt und Gliedern vorgenommen. Adolf Hitler ist der Träger dieser Bewegung. Die Zeit, die wir durchleben, ist von historischem Rang. Wir durchschreiten in Deutschland eine Umwälzung von unabsehbaren Ausmaßen. Die Revolution hat sich siegreich durchgesetzt. Ihre Ergebnisse werden in Deutschland einen politischen Zustand herbeiführen, in dem das Volk wieder zu Ehre, Arbeit und Brot kommt. February the 2nd to the 10th, 1933. Rumors to the effect that I will be appointed head of broadcasting. I've been sidelined. Magda is terribly unhappy. They're passing me over, giving me the cold shoulder. I am so depressed that I can't bring myself to think about it. They're pinning me up against the wall. Hitler is scarcely helping me. I've lost heart. Hitler called. He had already spoken to Funk, the press officer, about my ministry. A humiliation for me. 
wollen dich grüßen durch die Massen der Führer, der Reichskanzler Adolf Hitler, der Führer des jungen Deutschlands. Vor einem Monat noch sprach er hier im Sportpalast. Eine gute Regierung ohne Propaganda kann ebenso wenig bestehen wie eine gute Propaganda ohne eine gute Regierung. Beide müssen sich einander ergänzen. Und wenn die jüdischen Zeitungen heute glauben, auf versteckte Drohungen die nationalsozialistische Bewegung einschüchtern zu können, wenn sie heute glauben, unsere Notverordnungen umgehen zu dürfen, sie sollen sich hüten. Einmal wird unsere Geduld zu Ende sein und dann wird den Juden das breche Lügen mal gestoppt werden. Am 30. Januar dieses Jahres wurde die neue Regierung der nationalen Konzentration gewählt. February the 10th, 1933. The Führer gave a fantastic speech with a very sharply worded challenge to the communists. At the end, he drifted into wonderful, truly incredible pathos, concluding his oration with the word, Amen. It seemed so natural that everyone was captivated and deeply moved. It was filled with such power and faith, was so novel and courageous, and had such power and stature that nothing from the past bears comparison with it. February the 20th, 1933. I saw the film of the Fiora's speech at the Sports Palace. The footage worked very well. It will prove indispensable to us as a propaganda tool. This film will be shown wherever the Fiora cannot make speeches. Its power comes above all from the coherence and harmony of word, facial expression and gesture. Now meetings are becoming a real pleasure. We have a new subject that grips us all. We have enthusiasm, energy and absolute commitment for our cause. We have audiences that respond passionately. We can speak from the heart and we no longer need to spare our enemies' feelings. For the election, we're generating large amounts of money and this will put an end to all our financial problems. I set the propaganda machinery in motion and an hour later, the printing presses were chattering away. February the 21st, 1933. Our propaganda is considered to be exemplary, not just by the German press, but by the international press too. We have acquired so much expertise in this field during previous election campaigns that we can overcome our opponents. We frighten them and they hardly dare utter a word. Now we will show what the apparatus can achieve if you know how to use it.
March the 8th, 1933. I now have a structure for my ministry. It is divided into five major departments, covering radio, the press, film, propaganda, and theater. Those areas are all close to my heart, so I will be devoting my energy and passion to them. Today, the Hitler Youth marched along Unter den Linden. I can watch them for hours, thrilled, never tiring of the sight. The German Revolution is underway. Flags with swastikas fly outside every public building. Occasionally, civil servants object, but mild pressure is enough to bring them to heel. Die nationale Revolution, in deren Verlauf wir heute stehen. March the 15th, 1933. I held a press conference for the first time. I am developing a new, modern press strategy. Here, too, a complete break is required. Many of the people present were completely unsuitable for shaping public opinion. I'll be weeding them out very quickly. Overlapping responsibilities between my new portfolio and the existing ministries are causing some problems. But we Nazis always agree quickly on solutions because we approach everything in a spirit of sound common sense. March the 17th, 1933. The Potsdam celebrations are being held in the national socialist style for the first time. They are being broadcast throughout Germany. The nation in its entirety must be part of this event. I've been working on all aspects of the project until deep into the night and doing everything I can to impress this occasion on the minds of the young. March the 22nd, 1933. The cabinets and members of the Reichstag's journey from St. Nicholas Church to the Garrison Church was almost insufferable. We were all but crushed by the huge crowds. Hindenburg entered the Garrison Church with the Führer. A somber silence fell upon everyone present. The president read out his message to the members of the Reichstag and the German people. March 27th, 1933. I dictated a harshly worded article on the Jews and their smear campaign. This is the only thing to do. Jews don't respond to generosity or to a spirit of magnanimity. You have to show them what you are prepared to do. I sent my text by telegram to Munich so that the Führer gets a copy. He will decide when to start the campaign. March the 31st, 1933. Many people think the boycott will lead to war. If we stand up for ourselves, we only gain respect. If the anti-German smears abroad cease, the boycott will be stopped. Otherwise, we will fight to the death. April 25th, 1933. My trip home to Wright became a huge triumphal procession. I agreed to be honored for my mother's sake. She has been slandered, subjected to malicious gossip, despised and persecuted in this provincial little town, and she has suffered as a result. We all know how these petty bourgeois communities are. Now I want them to repay the years of suffering and moral torment with a true triumph. That's why I came home to show that her endless sufferings have not been in vain. Ich bin auf das Äußerste gerührt und beglückt durch den wunderbaren herzlichen Empfang, den mir das ganze Rheinland, den mir meine Vaterstadt und den mir in dieser Stunde der Rheinisch-Fälische Rundfunk bereitet. Im rheinischen Volk habe ich meine Wurzeln Sein Witz, 
sein Temperament, seine leichte Beweglichkeit sind die Leitsterne meines Lebens gewesen. In Berlin, wie in anderen Universitätsstädten Deutschlands, wurden undeutsche und unsittliche Bücher von den Studenten eingesammelt und öffentlich verbrannt. Das Scheiterhaufen auf dem Opernplatz in Berlin. May the 11th, 1933. Worked until late at home. In the evening, I gave a speech outside the opera house, in front of the bonfire, while the filthy, trashy books were being burned by the students. I was at the top of my fall. Huge crowds. Superb summer weather began today. The common Deutsche Mensch wird nicht nur ein Mensch des Buches, sondern auch ein Mensch des Charakters sein. Und dazu wollen wir euch erziehen. August the 19th, 1933, opening of the broadcasting fair, a grand, dignified occasion. My speech went down very well. Es ist nicht wahr, dass der Rundfunk ein Eigenleben neben der Zeit führen könnte. Er hat mehr als jede andere Form unseres öffentlichen Daseins die Pflicht, der Zeit, ihren Forderungen und Bedürfnissen Rechnung zu tragen und Ausdruck zu geben. Saw the exhibition. It turned out very well. Television is only months away. I made a call to the Far East and to the captain of the Bremen at sea. I could clearly be heard. People are stunned by the technological advances. Die Stärke eines guten Rundfunkprogramms liegt in der richtigen Dosierung zwischen Unterhaltung, Freude, Belehrung, Erziehung und Politik. Experimente gehören ins Laboratorium und nicht vor die Millionenschar der Rundfunkhörer. Also Sie schneiden das Bobrennen Gut. und Sie das Skispringen. Jawohl. Mein Führer, die Belegschaft der Siemenswerke und mit ihr das ganze schaffende deutsche Volk, gelobt ihnen, in unerschütterlicher Treue in diesem Kampf hinter ihnen zu stehen. Und komme, was kommen mag, die deutsche Ehre, die deutsche gleiche Berechtigung und den Frieden Europas zu verteidigen. Der Führer hat das Wort. Intellektuellen Schichten haben mir den Mut gegeben, dieses gigantische Werk zu beginnen. Sondern das kann ich sagen, den Mut habe ich nur gefasst, weil ich zwei Schichten kannte, den Bauer und den deutschen Arbeiter.
Vielleicht wird manch unter Ihnen sein, der es mir nicht verzeihen kann, dass ich die marxistischen Parteien vernichtete. Aber mein Freund, ich habe die anderen genauso vernichtet. Sie sind ein Sir John Simon. Monsieur Dolphus. Le docteur Goebbels arrived à la séance. Uh, the Bureau had hardly adjourned its meeting on Saturday. September the 25th, 1933. Went to League of Nations with Neurath. Depressing. A gathering of the dead. I was interested to see these people in real life. Sir John Simon, the English Foreign Minister, tall and imposing. Paul Boncourt, an unsavory poser, a Frenchman and man of letters, not a real man. The Austrian, Dolphus, a dwarf, a fop, a rogue, otherwise nothing unusual. They inspected and scrutinized me. Hm, how hugely superior we Germans really are. The whole affair lacked dignity and style. In the old days, Democrats fitted in well here and felt at home, but it isn't our sort of thing. The press were excited by me. They wanted interviews. Ich bin der festen Überzeugung, der Frieden in Europa muss erhalten bleiben. Ich bin weiterhin der festen Überzeugung, käme ein Krieg, er wäre das größte Unglück für die Welt. What does the new Germany think of economic development in the States? Wir betrachten die wirtschaftliche Entwicklung in Amerika mit dem allergrößten positiven Interesse. Dr. Goebbels says that uh, here we are in fact concerned with the greatest economic problem, economic and social problem, which the world has ever had to solve. Namely, to reinstate in the process of production the millions of people who have lost their jobs in factories and uh, uh, shops and offices. July the 5th, 1935, Wednesday. All kinds of tricky little chores in Heiligendamm. Richard Strauss wrote a particularly obnoxious letter to the Jew, Stefan Zweig. The police intercepted it. The letter is impudent and worse, really stupid. Now Strauss will have to go too. These artists all lack political principles. From Goethe to Strauss, away with them. Strauss writes to a Jew. That's disgusting. July the 15th, 1935, Saturday. Lazed around, chatting with the Führer. He's working hard on foreign policy. But domestic issues have claimed his attention too. Fury at Frick and his bureaucrats. He will probably go soon. And I won't be complaining. We had lunch together. Sunshine, relaxation, a stroll with the Führer. It was touching to see ordinary people. The women were so happy, they cried. I could scarcely hold back the tears. Time spent with Fjord and Helga. She is sweet. Sunday, breakfast at the Führer's. He was delighted by the two beautiful days. We planned to create a large spa for working men and women on one of the North Sea Islands. 10,000 beds, 15 million marks. We were both incredibly excited. Then the Führer leaves. I stay behind, feeling sad. Was wäre diese Bewegung ohne die Propaganda geworden? Und wohin geriete unser Staat, wenn nicht eine wirklich schöpferische Propaganda ihm heute noch das geistige Gesicht gäbe?
March the 22nd, 1936. Early to work, appeal to the nation. I give a pep talk to the press. The election campaign is consuming almost all of my time. Went out to the Vonce with Magda and looked at a summer house. It really would be nice if we could rent or buy it. It's on the island of Schwanenwerder with a glorious lakeside location. Let's wait and see. So, don't schlaf schön. We got to live in there. Papa. Und das freut einen, dass so viele mit dem goldenen Parteiabzeichen dabei sind. Sind Sie Landarbeiter, ja? Wie viele Kinder haben Sie? Zwölf. Da muss ich mich ja genieren. Und wie viele Kinder haben Sie? Drei. Also hier, das ist das Beispiel. Da hinten sind einer, der hat 32. Ja, ja, aber nicht von einer. Was? Wie viele haben Sie? Drei. Drei, das ist ja gar nichts. Aber ich bin ja noch. May the 19th, 1936. Went out to Schwanenwerder in glorious sunshine. Magda was kind and sweet. Long boat trip. My employee, Hegert, is concerned the military will absorb our efforts if war comes. A general as head of propaganda. A grotesque idea. I'll fight against that. Propaganda should be left to those who understand it. June the 20th, 1936. Yesterday, Schwanenwerder. We were waiting for Max Schmeling's fight with Joe Lewis. We were on tenterhooks the whole evening with Schmeling's wife. We told each other stories, laughed and cheered. And the masses in the stadium stay on the stools and see the endspurt of Max Schmeling. Max, weiter, weiter, kein Pardon. Weiter. In round 12, Schmeling knocked out the Negro. Fantastic, a dramatic, thrilling fight. Schmeling fought for Germany and won. The white man prevailed over the black, and the white man was German. I didn't get to bed until five. November the 6th, 1936. Miss Riefenstahl is treating me to her histrionics. There's no way I can work with a lunatic like her. And there's something wrong. Now she wants half a million more to make a second film. I remained as cold as ice towards her. She started sobbing. Women always do this. It doesn't work with me anymore. She needs to start doing real work and get organized. Der Deutsche Filmpreis, 1937-38 wurde Frau Leni Riefenstahl für ihr Filmwerk Olympia, Fest der Völker, Fest der Schönheit, zuerkannt. Mit einem Fleiß ohnegleichen, mit vorbildlicher Genauigkeit, mit größtem technischem und künstlerischem Können, wurde hier eine Leistung vollbracht, die nicht nur bei uns, sondern auch in der Presse des Auslandes die größte Bewunderung fand. November the 6th, 1936. I drove out to the Bogensee Lake. Everything was calm and peaceful here. A place where one can work and think. And splendid autumn weather. Spent the late afternoon reading. Emil Ludwig's Murder in Davos. A nasty, veritably Jewish effort. It could turn you into an anti-Semite if you weren't one already. This Jewish plague needs to be eradicated. Utterly. Every last trace. Spent time chatting, reading, writing. To bed on time. Sleeping out here in the forest is wonderful. December the 12th, 1936. Cut the editors in chief of the dissident press down to size, told them what's what, gave them countless examples of their irresponsibility. And that's the end of that. 
From now on, I'll be imposing tough penalties. I expect order and compliance. December the 3rd, 1937. Popped over to Schwanenwerda late in the afternoon. Magda was a little sick. She was so kind and patient. The children were so sweet. I loved them all dearly. We chatted, played and messed around. It was great fun. In the evening, I monitored some films in Berlin. Maidenhood, a Prague film with Lida Barova. Wonderful acting, magnificently directed, but the locations were somewhat grubby and dirty. Typically Czech, it does absolutely nothing for me. But there's no denying how skillfully everything was done. Deutschland begeht in den Bayreuther Festspielen 1938 den 125. Geburtstag Richard Wagners, in dessen unsterblichem Wirken die germanische Welt ihren herrlichsten Ausdruck fand. July the 25th, 1938. Bayreuth, Villa Wanfried. Magda was very happy. She is better and we are both happy to be back together. The Führer had already arrived. He was in a good mood, very friendly. The festival. Tristan. We all showed up in a big procession. First scene, magnificent. Second, slightly embarrassing and kitschy. The final scene, not good either. But that music, those acoustics, incomparable. Thousands of Czech Germans are below, calling out for the Führer. It's truly stirring. The Führer told me he will be resolving this issue very soon, and he'll be as good as his word. The big opportunity will arise one day. August the 18th, 1938. A tough day. A long heart-to-heart -heart talk with Magda in the evening, which was ultimate humiliation for me. I'll never forgive her. She is so hard on me and cruel. I need powerful medication to sleep, and I haven't eaten a thing for three days. The same, never-ending routine at work. I can hardly bear it anymore. I have no one to help me. I don't want anyone anyway. It's important to feel pain in life and never to run away from problems. This is the most tormented moment of my life. November the 10th, 1938. Major demonstrations against the Jews in Kassel and Dessau. Synagogue set alight and shops demolished. In the afternoon, news came that the German diplomat von Rath was murdered by a Jew. But I'm feeling better now. Went to a party reception in the old city hall, which was packed. I mentioned the Jewish matter to the Führer. He said, let the demonstrations continue and withdraw the police. The Jews need to experience the people's fury at first hand, just this once. It's only right and proper. I passed the requisite instructions to the police and party. Everyone rushed to fulfill their orders. Now it's time for the people to act. Gelegentlich seiner Reise, die ihn durch verschiedene Staaten des europäischen Südostens führte, besuchte Reichsminister Dr. Goebbels Ägypten, wo er von der deutschen Kolonie in Kairo begeistert begrüßt wurde. Bei Gizeh besichtigte Dr. Goebbels die Pyramiden und ließ sich anschließend von dem Leiter der deutschen Ausgrabungen bei Sakara, Dr. Juncker, die historischen Denkmäler und den Stand der Ausgrabungen erläutern. August 
August the 23rd, 1939, yesterday, the announcement of the non-aggression pact with Moscow proved to be a global sensation. The balance of power in Europe has been shifted. London and Paris are stunned. The Poles are full of bravado, but that makes them look ridiculous. It was a brilliant move by the Führer. Let's see how the world reacts. Military convoys are moving. I work without a break from midday to late afternoon. I'm supposed to be dictating my speech for the party conference, but it's an impossible task. I have no idea who I'm supposed to be attacking and who I'm not. The Führer wants to speak to me. I agree to visit him on Wednesday. September the 1st, 1939, yesterday. At noon, the Führer issues the order to attack at about 5 a.m. It seems the die is cast now. Goering remains skeptical. The Führer doesn't believe the English will intervene. Excitement has reached a maximum level. At home, work. I put finishing touches to the proclamation to the people and the party. I work on propaganda posters for Poland. We are prepared. April the 18th, 1940. The Führer praised the Luftwaffe. It has completely revolutionized war. In the long term, sea power will be no match for air power. We have an advantage in this area and need to maintain it at all times. Question, when are we going to make our move? That depends on the weather, which is still lousy. We need to attack England. And once we start, we must finish the job. We can't afford any more delays, so we need to be patient. July the 5th, 1940. How much longer until it really gets going? I can hardly restrain our press, and the people too. They are thirsting for war against England. October the 18th, 1940. Took off from Tempelhof early in the morning arrived outside Paris at about 1 p.m. Reichsminister Dr. Goebbels besuchte die Soldaten der Westfront. In einem Fliegerhorst der Luftverteidigungszone West. Das Material, das unsere Aufklärer heimbrachten, wird sofort ausgewertet, um der Führung Kenntnis von allen Bewegungen des Feindes zu verschaffen. I attended the briefing, all very disciplined and stylish. Things here look well organized. I talked with Goering for a long time. His people are wonderful. October the 19th, 1940. I traveled to Paris with Goering. What a wonderful place. The peacetime, big city atmosphere is back again. Lots of soldiers. I strolled through the streets with Goering. Then I bought a few things in the shops. In the evening, we went to the Casino de Paris, a variety theater. Not as good as in Berlin, but plenty of beautiful women and a lot of nudity. We would never dream of putting that on a Berlin stage. Hate at Maxim's. It's nice to be with Goering, who is being very kind to me. He has a fantastic lifestyle. The war seems a million miles away. Goering really is a nice chap. I went to bed late, dead tired. October the 20th, 1940. Flight to Trouville. In the distance, the English coast. 
Magnificent weather. Fighters scream past overhead. Göring has everything under control. Their Majesties continue to share with their people the perils of the London air raids. They have spent many hours inspecting the damage and personally seeing that everything possible is being done for the homeless and distressed. They toured, among many other places, the famous Madame Tussauds, an early casualty. And here are some of the victims rescued after the bombing. If only they were real. And as everyone knows, the big shops in Oxford Street have been badly hit. The bombing of places like this may seem terrible. It is in fact shocking, but it certainly won't win the war for Hitler. October the 23rd, 1940. Churchill has issued an appeal to the people of France, impudent, offensive, and bristling with hypocrisy. A revolting, fat beast. I drafted a speech with a sharp, withering response. If we don't answer them, the English will continue to draw strength from their illusions. Lieber Papi, die Soldaten, siehst du uns hier auch marschieren? Und du hast es schon erraten, wir sind da und gratulieren. Wusst heraus und Krieg gefasst, weil du halt Geburtstag hast. October the 30th, 1940. 43 years old. A little reflection and meditation which helps on a day like this. The children were first to wish me happy birthday. They stood in line like organ pipes, recited their poems and gave me gifts and flowers. How wonderfully sweet. We watched a film of the children with tears of joy and sadness. It was all so nice. November the 7th, 1940. Rain and fog. Dismal weather in Prague. Saw the sights. St. Vitus Cathedral with all its treasures and the magnificent old buildings, streets and squares. I am in love with this city. It feels German. And we will have to make it German again. Reception in the city hall, in a truly beautiful room. Long speeches. I added a few kind words too. Our people here are constantly getting at the Czechs, reopening the old wounds. That isn't good propaganda. I try to repair the damage. April the 2nd, 1941. In the evening, premiere of Uncle Kruger, for a large group of guests at my home. Fantastic excitement. The film is a great success. Everyone was thrilled. The star, Emil Jannings, has managed to surpass himself. The kind of anti-English film you can only dream of. Dafür habe ich dich nach England geschickt, dass du mir wiederkommst als ein Fremder. Du bist ja für Engländer. Das darfst du nicht sagen, Vater. Was darf ich nicht? Kannst du die Wahrheit nicht hören? Sieh dich doch an. Sieht so ein Buch aus? England, England. Jedes dritte Wort England. England ist unser Feind. Unser unerbittlicher Feind. Wer mit England paktiert, liefert sich England aus. Aber solange ich lebe, wird das nicht geschehen. Das schwöre ich dir. So wann mir Gott helfe. April the 6th, 1941. Feelings are running high over Uncle Kruger. The reviews have been wonderful. A few stuffy bureaucrats from the foreign ministry have taken exception. Everyone else is thrilled. Reichsminister Dr. Goebbels empfing Staatsschauspieler Emil Jannings, um ihm seine besondere Anerkennung für den neuen Tobis-Großfilm Ohm Krüger zum Ausdruck zu bringen. 
Bei dieser Gelegenheit überreichte der Reichsminister Emil Jannings als erstem deutschen Filmkünstler den neu geschifteten Ehrenring des deutschen Films, der in Zukunft für besonders große Verdienste auf dem Gebiet der deutschen Filmkunst verliehen wird. May the 13th, 1941. In the evening, dreadful news. In breach of the Führer's orders, Hess took off in a plane and has not been seen since Saturday. We have to assume he is dead. The Führer's communique suggested delusions as the cause of his flight, together with misplaced hopes of securing a peace agreement, an almost unbearable setback. Unser Dank ist das Gelöbnis, in guten und in bösen Tagen zu Ihnen zu stehen. Komme, was da wolle. It's impossible to assess the consequences at the moment. The Führer is absolutely crushed. What a spectacle for the world. The Führer's deputy turned into a psychological wreck. It's horrific and unthinkable. We grit our teeth and plow on. June the 22nd, 1941. Yesterday, I told my staff. Incredible astonishment everywhere. The majority had already guessed the truth. Started working immediately, feverishly. The radio, press and newsreel services were all mobilized. Everything ran like clockwork. 3.30 a.m. The heavy artillery is thundering now. God bless our weapons. Outside, Wilhelmplatz is empty and silent. Berlin is slumbering. The Reich is slumbering. A great, wonderful era giving birth to a new Reich. A painful birth, maybe, but it is already striving towards the light. A new fanfare is resounding. Powerful, thunderous, and majestic. I read out the Führer's proclamation to the German people for all the radio stations. It was a momentous occasion for me as well. The burdens of weeks and months past were shed. I feel utterly liberated. The Führer zieht nach monatelangem Schweigen nunmehr in zwölfter Stunde die noch einzig mögliche Konsequenz mit den Worten Ich habe mich entschlossen, das Schicksal und die Zukunft des Deutschen Reiches wieder in die Hand unserer Soldaten zu legen. June the 24th, 1941. 1,600 feet of newsreel from the start of our Russian campaign. Some of our new weapons are shown. Huge monstrosities that smash to pieces everything in their way. The divine judgment of history is being passed on the Soviet Union. The anti-Russian front in Europe is taking shape almost by itself. We are doing nothing ourselves so as not to arouse suspicion. I believe the war against Moscow will prove our greatest coup psychologically and perhaps even militarily as well. June the 27th, 1941. Statements from Russian prisoners of war reveal truly dreadful ignorance. That is the product of the Bolshevik education system. No sign of any training or discipline. Many soldiers are shooting themselves rather than being taken prisoner because people have put the fear of God into them about our men. Our broadcast propaganda isn't getting through, so we need to drop leaflets in order to set them straight. August the 20th, 1941. The Führer has told me that I can deport the Jews from Berlin immediately the Eastern campaign is over. Berlin must be Jew-free. It is an outrageous scandal that 78,000 Jews, most of them parasites, can roam happily in the capital of the German Reich. They ruin not only the city's appearance, but the atmosphere as well. Things will change for the better when they have to wear badges, but getting rid of them is the only way to solve the problem completely. September the 1st, 1941. Venice looks like a real jewel in the midst of the sea again. It really is the most beautiful city I know. I'm staying on a boat, the Cyprus, which is anchored near St. Mark's Square and offers a wonderful panorama of the city. You can get some peace and quiet on the boat and don't get caught up in the bustle and hurly-burly of the Biennale quite as much. 
Venice packed with film people from all around the world. Lunch at a wonderful palazzo by the Canal Grande. That's what makes Venice so grand. And I would love to transplant at least one of these magnificent palaces into the stony wilderness that is our capital. Every time you enter one of these palaces, you appreciate how vital it is to rebuild Berlin along the grandest lines, so that it offers interesting sights for visitors a few centuries from now. September the 2nd, 1941. With the exception of Mussolini, the Italians have no leaders whatsoever. They claim to be masters of improvisation, but for the most part, their improvisations go wrong. Organizing and preparing for something systematically, that's not their forte. In the evening, to mark the start of the Italian contribution to the Biennale, the new Roman film, The Iron Crown, is being shown. The premiere is a complete flop. The film is a grand anthology of cinematic implausibilities. It's not even worth discussing. The Italians had pinned all their hopes on this premiere, but their own audience was upset. I am very happy that failed literary experiments of this type are no longer possible in German cinema. I have worked indefatigably to eliminate all this aestheticizing experimentation. It can only be to our benefit that the Italians lack any kind of talent in this field. The evening concluded with a monumental reception given at Cinecittà, with lots of pomp and ceremony. But what good are gala events if the films are hopeless? Films matter, not receptions. After the event, I took a stroll through the moonlit city. Venice possesses an enchanting beauty, especially when there is no artificial lighting and its towers and silhouettes are a veritably magical sight. The war is a remote, if unavoidable, necessity, and this city demonstrates more persuasively than ever that war can only ever be the means to an end, never an end in itself. Prince of Wales has anchored. Mr. Churchill leaves to go aboard the United States cruiser Augusta, in which Mr. Roosevelt, supposed to be on a fishing trip in his yacht Potomac, has come to the appointed place. September the 7th, 1941. I was shown a film of the meeting between Roosevelt and Churchill in the Atlantic. It is miserably and amateurishly made, meriting no attention whatsoever. So this rubbish is what the English call propaganda. How superior we are to our enemies in this area. They make a lot of noise, but it's all about nothing. Hello, everyone. Ja. Hello, everyone. Can we not hear more? We will come to Ian. Yeah, naturally. It's not Ian, eh? Wunderbar. Jetzt bist du eilig. Yes. October the 16th, 1941. During the past two years, we have produced cinematic achievements of previously undreamt of proportions. This is mainly due to our success in presenting modern themes in modern ways. Ich fahre jetzt zur Wohnung meines Bruders, zieh mich dort rasch um und bringe meinen Koffer her. Können wir morgen eine ganze Karte früher lösen? Etwas früher lösen. Bisschen einen Satz früher lösen. The new cinema generation is mediocre. 
They make a far too bourgeois impression. Hardly any of the men or women we have chosen will leave their mark internationally. This must change. If German cinema is to conquer the world, it must boast actors who can become household names. I'm not going to relax until we have made real progress in this area. November the 19th, 1941. I have been reading Churchill's book, Blood, Toil, Tears and Sweat, a compilation of his speeches from the past two years. It demonstrates a polemical intelligence and is written with exceptional skill. He does have a distinct style, even if the cynicism of his arguments seems somewhat surprising to our way of thinking. There's no denying that Churchill is an adversary who demands respect. He isn't quite as stupid as Chamberlain was. November the 30th, 1941. The Führer has never taken the view that we should seize any major Soviet cities. There is no practical benefit, and you end up having to feed masses of women and children. The aim is not to occupy Moscow and Leningrad. They are to be destroyed and the land ploughed up. I find the Führer's disdain for prestige in his handling of the war admirable. He isn't even contemplating conquering Moscow and holding a victory parade there. The objective of this kind of war is not to win prizes, but to destroy the enemy. That's what counts, and we are seeking to attain this goal with all our might. December the 21st, 1941. I am reading a lengthy report from the end of November, drafted by an officer on the Eastern Front. It was sobering reading. Everything there is in short supply. Food, petrol, weapons, ammunition, people. The mood among the troops is still relatively good. Nevertheless, they have a vague feeling that something has gone wrong. The Führer's appeal will, of course, have a liberating effect. Our overly optimistic propaganda, by which I mean the propaganda that, very much against my will, seemed to assume that the campaign in the East had already been won, is regarded with utter contempt. The Reich's press officer, Dr. Dietrich, hasn't got a clue how much damage he has done. His speech was an absolute disaster. At the precise moment he was talking, the soldiers at the front were fighting their toughest battles and facing their greatest hardships. It's easy to imagine what the simple infantryman makes of this patriotic drivel. I am only disappointed that people hold me partly responsible. Although I not only had nothing to do with them, I fought against them. February the 15th, 1943. In the late afternoon, I began dictating my speech for the sports palace. I had finished and corrected it by evening. I believe it is very effective. It may prove to be one of my most masterful achievements as an orator. A speech like this is needed for morale. It is necessary to give the German people some encouragement. If only it were possible to reproduce yourself a million times over so that you could achieve a million times more than you can today. February the 19th, 1943. Yesterday. At 5 p.m., the long-awaited rally at the Sports Palace began. The numbers were overwhelming. The gates had to be closed at 4.30. The atmosphere recalled a wild mood of mass hysteria. The people of Berlin are currently the most alert political audience we have in the Reich. Almost the entire cabinet, large numbers of regional directors and Gauleiters, and almost all the secretaries of state were present. This was indeed a cross-section of the entire German population. Wir sind 
Kriegsmaßnahme der Regierung. Es will nicht den totalen Krieg, sagen die Engländer, sondern die Kapitulation. Wollt ihr den totalen Krieg? I was, I believe, in very good speaking form and elevated the rally into a state of total spiritual mobilization. The rally ended in tumultuous chaos. The sports palace has never experienced such scenes, not even before 1933. The German nation is prepared to sacrifice everything for the war and our victory. I will make sure that total war does not remain pure theory. March the 3rd, 1943. I learned en route to Berlin that the city had been hit by a major air raid during the night. From the initial report, I could not have appreciated the full impact of the attack. I immediately took a tour of the city to inspect some of the damage. I began at St. Hedwig's Church, which was in a terrible mess. The priest at St. Hedwig's begged me to find another hall for their services. I granted this request. Small gifts foster friendships.
May the 7th, 1943. I discussed our new major project, Kohlberg. In this film, we portray a courageous man and the determination of a community to resist, even though their plight appears desperate. This film will serve as an important lesson, particularly in those areas under attack. The film is based on real events. Les Prussiens ne tirent pas, mais où reste donc l'artillerie de Gneisenau? The director Harlan, who initially hadn't wanted to do the film, is now all for it. He promises me the premiere for Christmas. We will probably be in dire need of it by then. November the 24th, 1943. I got an overview of the situation in Berlin, which is depressing indeed. I just can't work out how the English have done so much damage. The propaganda ministry was spared for the most part. The scene confronting me at Wilhelmplatz was one of utter desolation. First thing in the morning, an extended conference with the party's district directors and others responsible for Berlin, during which we discussed what needs to be done. We are improvising a lot. It is clear that the response to the bombing raids is exceptionally effective. Berliners know instinctively when it's worth trying to save an area and when they ought to be leaving it. Der Gauleiter besucht Berliner Verpflegungsstellen. Zigaretten werden verteilt. Es ist jedem die Möglichkeit gegeben, dem Minister persönlich seine Sorgen und Nöte vorzutragen. Dr. Goebbels sagte, weder Engländer noch Bolschewisten werden Berlin wieder aufbauen, wenn wir diesen Krieg nicht siegreich bestehen. Wieder aufgebaut wird diese Stadt einzig und allein von uns selbst. February the 25th, 1944. The Führer found warm words for the people of Berlin. He stressed that Berlin had only truly become the Reich's capital during the raids of recent months. Berliners had demonstrated a courage and manliness during the bombing raids that few had thought they possessed. June the 7th, 1944. Yesterday, during the night, the first reports started arriving about the Allied invasion in the West. The Führer was in an exceptionally lively mood. The invasion is taking place exactly where we had anticipated it. Unless absolutely everything goes wrong, we should be able to cope. Unfortunately, the enemy has already sent some tank units into action, but we will be mobilizing our reserves. Two top-rate tank divisions have already left. The Führer is convinced that we will expel the enemy units that have landed and wipe out their paratroops. Mit stärkstem Beifall nahmen die Versammelten die Ausführungen des Reichsministers über den Einsatz der neuen deutschen Waffe V1 auf. Ich habe damals nach den schweren Angriffen auf die Reichshauptstadt vom 21. und 22. November in Berlin erklärt, es wird die Stunde kommen, wo wir das den Engländern heimzahlen werden. Die englische Presse hat mich am anderen Tag auf das Massivste angegriffen und die höhnische Frage aufgeworfen, ob die neue Waffe, die ich dort angekündigt hätte, etwa im Propagandaministerium statt im Rüstungsministerium erfunden worden wäre. Ich habe es damals nicht für meine Aufgabe gehalten, die Engländer eines Besseren zu belehren, sondern ich war im Gegenteil der Überzeugung, je länger sie glauben, dass sie nicht kommt, umso besser ist es. Denn Überraschung ist auch eine Waffe. 
June the 18th, 1944. Our weapons of retaliation are the number one subject right around the globe. The English may be doing everything within their power to counter our new secret weapon, but they aren't succeeding. The people of London are panic-stricken, flabbergasted. The bombardment of London hasn't really halted since Thursday evening. There is no real defense against our missiles. July the 7th, 1944. Enthusiasm has subsided dramatically. Both the V1 and our attempts to repel the invasion in the West have been disappointing, nor is anyone holding out much hope in the East. Our information management has come in for severe criticism in the press and on the radio. Our journalists and presenters have again been shooting their mouths off too much, something I have always criticized. The people don't want any more glossing over of problems. They want to hear the truth and nothing but. Hegert believes we could harness the slogan, blood, toil, tears, and sweat for our own ends. A slogan like that would render us immune to any setbacks. Der Tag des Volkssturms ist ein kraftvoller Beweis dafür, dass kein Feind Terror das deutsche Volk beugen kann und dass die Herzen seiner Menschen über Masse, Material und Hass triumphieren werden. December the 1st, 1944. Kohlberg was shown. It is a true masterpiece. Keine Liebe ist heiliger als die Liebe zum Vaterland. Keine Freude ist süßer als die Freude der Freiheit. Aber ihr wisst, was uns blüht, wenn wir diesen Kampf nicht ehrenvoll gewinnen. Darum, welche Opfer von dem Einzelnen auch gefordert werden mögen, sie wiegen die heiligen Güter nicht auf, für die wir kämpfen und siegen müssen, wenn wir nicht aufhören wollen, Preußen und Deutsche zu sein. Bürger und Soldaten, vom Karrensknecht bis zum Bürgergeneral. Die beste Verteidigung einer Festung ist der Angriff! The film is positioned so skillfully, politically speaking as well, that you might suspect it had been commissioned to provide answers to all those questions currently agitating the German people. In terms of the morale of the nation, this film is equivalent to winning a battle. February the 28th, 1945. There's no point anymore in tiptoeing around the issues, nor will it help the Führer if we remain silent to spare his feelings. The discussion I had with him was extremely heated and dramatic. But the Führer agreed with me on each of my points. I felt he was annoyed that the situation had deteriorated so much and not that I had spoken so bluntly and frankly. If someone like Goering steps completely out of line, he must be brought to reason. Bemeddled fools and vain, perfumed fops have no place in our war leadership. I shall not rest until the Führer has restored order. For instance, it is quite simply terrible style for a senior officer of the Reich to be prancing around in a silver-gray uniform right now. What effeminate behavior, given the current situation. I certainly hope the Führer succeeds in making a man out of Göring again. Kampfraum Frankfurt, unsere Stellungen an der Oder. Der Gauleiter von Berlin, Reichsminister Dr. Goebbels, verschafft sich einen persönlichen Eindruck von den Vorbereitungen zum Abwehrkampf. Der Minister mit Ritterkreuzträger General der Infanterie Busse. Entlang der Oder haben sich Grenadiere und MG-Trupps eingenistet. March the 9th, 1945. At midday, I drove out to Görlitz. The weather was clear and frosty. The countryside was bathed in glorious sunshine. On leaving the ruins of Berlin, you enter a region that seems completely untouched by the war. It's a really happy feeling to be in the countryside and breathe fresh air once again. 
The residents' lives have only been disrupted slightly. They are to be envied. Immediately afterwards, we approached the front and entered the war zone. In the distances, you can see the occasional flash from enemy or German guns. Then we arrived in Lauban. The town was fairly badly damaged during the previous day's fighting. Gegen diesen Ort vor Görlitz treten in den ersten Märztagen mit starker Schlachtliegerunterstützung deutsche Panzer und Grenadiere zum Gegenangriff an. Nach tagelangen heißen Gefechten dringen die Deutschen am 6. März in die Stadt ein. Paratroopers who fought magnificently during the Lauban operation were on parade in the rubble of Lauban's marketplace. General Schoener addressed the troops and found the most complimentary words for me and my work. In particular, he praised my constant, indefatigable efforts to promote total war. He said, I was one of the few men that the frontline troops listened to. No trace whatsoever of defeatism. I experienced this for myself when addressing the home guard in the crammed town hall in Görlitz. My speech was about the need to fight and never give up. Jene Divisionen, die jetzt schon zu kleinen Offensiven angetreten sind und in den nächsten Wochen und Monaten zu großen Offensiven antreten werden, werden in diesen Kampf hineingehen wie in einen Gottesdienst. Und wenn sie ihre Gewehre schultern und ihre Panzerfahrzeuge besteigen, dann haben sie nur ihre erschlagenen Kinder und geschändeten Frauen vor Augen und ein Schrei der Rache wird aus ihren Kehlen emporsteigen, vor dem der Feind erblassen wird. In the German city of Reit, there is an ancient castle which the people of the city presented to Dr. Goebbels. They'd been ordered to do so by the Nazi party, but I don't suppose they raised any objections, for at that time they thought the doctor was a very fine fellow. They had a rather special regard for Goebbels because he was born in Reit. We know, of course, how unfortunate it is that Goebbels was ever born at all. March the 11th, 1945. What upsets me most is the behavior of the people from my hometown of Wright. The Americans have made much of it. A certain Herr Vogelsang, known to me from the early days as a full-blown National Socialist Philistine, went to the American occupation authorities, offering to be the mayor. I'm going to deal with this man. I am preparing a plan to liquidate him at the first possible opportunity. It will be carried out by party members from Berlin, trained for this type of operation. The Americans, as was to be expected, have launched a so-called free German newspaper in Wright, one of the first towns to be occupied. But their triumph seems to be somewhat premature. I shall find ways to put things right again, at least in Wright. Berlin. Auf euch sind die Blicke eurer Frauen, eurer Mütter und eurer Kinder gerichtet. Sie haben euch ihr Leben, ihr Glück, ihre Gesundheit und ihre Zukunft anvertraut. Ihr kennt jetzt eure Aufgabe und ich weiß, ihr werdet sie vorbildlich erfüllen. Die Stunde eurer Bewährung ist da. Ich bleibe mit meinen Mitarbeitern selbstverständlich in Berlin. 
Auch meine Frau und meine Kinder sind hier und bleiben hier. Mit allen Mitteln werde ich die Verteidigung der Reichshauptstadt aktivieren. Mein Denken und Handeln gilt eurem Wohl und der Abwehr unseres gemeinsamen Feindes. An den Mauern unserer Stadt wird und muss der Mongolensturm gebrochen werden. Unser Kampf wird das Fanal sein für den entschlossensten Kampf der ganzen Nation. Von dem fanatischen Willen erfüllt, die Hauptstadt des Reiches nicht in die Hände der Bolschewisten fallen zu lassen, sind wir solidarisch zu Kampf und Arbeit angetreten.